Praise God. <laughs> God seems like from the Bible only ordained the two institutions in human society. One is a family. As we know, God created an Adam and Eve, and he officiated the first wedding in the Garden of Eden. So he created a family, and also another one he ordained as an institution that he pleases is the church. In Old Testament, the church looked like kingdom of God, that he was the ruler and he was a king, and people in Israel represented his church. But as we read and we heard last week, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he gave a promise to his disciples. When due time comes, the Holy Spirit will fall upon you. When that happens, you will receive power, and also you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem in all Judea, and also in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as church, we can understand these witnesses get together in common place to worship God and honor Him, and that is called the church. Church is comprised with the people who are baptized by the Holy Spirit, who profess that Jesus is the Lord and the Savior, which is us. So today, we want to take a look at the passage where the very first church God has ordained by baptizing these believers of Jesus Christ. And church was formed and initiated, and this is a primitive church. And by examining the dimensions of this very church that we can understand in today's church, God also desires continually how we want to be operating by the power of the Holy Spirit and what kind of dimensions and what kind of activities that we want to engage to be His powerful representative and also be the church that He pleases and He can continually and powerfully use. As we understood from last time, God, Jesus promised them, when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will be upon you. So as we continually read through the book of Acts, in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell upon the people. These people, his disciples, and all together, about 120 of them, went to upper room. And we don't know exactly that room was located. However, they got together every day, and in one accord, they prayed together, asking God, let your promise be upon us and they continually prayed and along while they prayed Peter stood up among 12 now they had only had 11 of them and they elected another disciple another apostle and that was Matthias so 12 of them and also other people got together diligently prayed and on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they began to speak in tongue. And all these people to celebrate this feast of Pentecost, they came and watched these people praying in tongue and they were astonished. And they said, you're drunken. But that was at third hour, which is 9 a.m. in the morning. So people, 120 of them, will not be drunken in the morning. Normally, people get drunk at night. Amen. <laughs> Some people do get drunk in the morning, but not these 120 people. They were drunken with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak the languages they couldn't understand. But however, all these uh, Jewish diasporas came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Pentecost. There are the people who came from Egypt, from Arabia, from uh, Asia, from Rome. And all these people who spoke different languages were able to understand. 120 people spoke their languages, different languages. So they were so shocked. 
what is happening. Then Peter stood up and spoke the very first gospel. And about 3,000 people were convicted. And in one single day, these people were converted and accepted Christ as a Savior. And I like to see that kind of day to happen to our ministry. In a single day, 3,000 people were convicted in their hearts who will receive Christ as a Savior. Amen? And so very first the church was established, this kind of church planting, no one will refuse. With the 3,000 initial church planting members, you begin the very first the church. And as we want to look at the dimensions and activities and the lifestyle of this very first church, let's look at the book of Acts chapter 2 from verse 42 through 47. If we want to examine their lifestyle, their dimensions, and also their activities, and we want to embrace them and apply it to our church life, so that we may also be the powerful church and witnesses. Book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I will read this verse, and you can read 43. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did it their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added it to the church daily, such as should be saved. Amen. As we want to look at and observe this very primitive church, their lifestyle, dimensions, and activities, that we can see four activities or dimensions from this passage or their church life that we want to understand and study and also apply to our church life. First, their first activity was upward activity. That is church to God. Church to God, where well, we can call that worship or upward activity as a church. They got together daily. Oftentimes they got together daily and they praised God and they prayed to God and also They heard the voice of God. They studied the doctrines taught by the apostles. So these activities belong to, as a church, was gearing towards God. They got together daily, praying and praising, and also hearing the word of God, learning the doctrines from the apostles. And that is the first activity. And we are very familiar with this activity. As a church, we come every Sunday and we praise and worship God and we listen to His Word and we pray together. But however, as we examine this passage, seemingly they got together daily, every day. So it's not a Korean thing that people come to church many days out of week the very first church they got together every day every day but not grudging me they were not dragged by but they are filled with with the holy spirit they are all joyful they were in power willingly they wanted to get together every day and worship god and praise him and pray together and listen to the gracious word of god that's what they did So as a church, the very first activity, lifestyle, we need to engage is church to God. Upward activity, worshiping God daily. Even though because our society and social system, yes, it will be difficult for us to come to church every day and engage into this kind of 
worship style. However, as a church, we do have worship every day. That is every morning, 6 a.m. Because no one is, almost no one is working except the people who work for Starbucks works at 6 a.m. So we can all come before we engage any activity, daily routines. Come to church every day, worship God, hear God's words, and pray together. And so early morning prayer, early morning worship is not something that is designed by Korean people. It's a biblical, I believe. That's what we do. Second thing is church to church. That's inward activity. That's fellowship. These are the people got together daily from house to house sometimes. And sometimes they got together in the temple and they worshiped God. But also they had a fellowship together. They broke bread together. And also we know because they're obeying command from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said to them, in remembrance of me, when you get together, break the bread. So they exercise the Lord's Supper together. But also we can understand, as they got together, they ate together quite often. So eating is a large aspect of church life. So when I return back to EM, as you probably notice it, we are eating a lot together. It's not because I enjoy eating. Yes, I do. But it's because as a body of Christ, as we get together, there's a special thing about as we open our mouth to feed ourselves with the food, as we open our mouth, naturally we begin to open our hearts to one another as well. So there's a, that segment. The more we get together, to, the more we enjoy meals together, easily we can have a fellowship, intimacy, one another. That's why today as we celebrate 31st anniversary, we are going to have a taco. So anytime, whether it's a singles seminar, couples retreat, or cell leaders meeting, we want to have a, either refreshment or meal together because that is a very important. Why? Because we are the family. The family get together and enjoy meal. Some years ago, I had an opportunity to, to have a lunch with the mayor of the city of Fullerton. He was a Hispanic. As a, we were having a meal together, and of course, he liked the Korean food, uh, so we took him to a Korean restaurant. And as we were conversing, and I asked him, as a, his, as a person who has a Hispanic background, we can say, you are a successful man becoming a mayor of city of Fullerton. So as you are growing up, what can you share with us that, that you did not go astray like a lot of American families? This is challenging where children grow up and they fall into addiction of drug or, or all kinds of mess and so forth. But you grow up to be a successful man and you can be a model and representative to Hispanic community. And he said, you know one thing from my family that I can say that is with my parents and with my siblings, we got together and we ate together. We ate together. And he shared this one thing. Those children, those people who become rebellious and go through uh, some sort of sufferings and and problems in the life, and you examine those families, they rarely got together as a family and ate together. So eating together as a family is so important. So as a pastor, even though I am so busy, but I try to go home and eat together with my family, with my children. So that is very important. So as a family of God, coming together and enjoying meal together, and look at life of Jesus where he ministered to people. He always got together, even with the sinners, with the prostitutes. He ate together. 
Remember, before he was crucified, the last thing he did with his disciples was getting together and having last Passover, eating together with his disciples. The very first thing he did after he was resurrected, he got and together with his disciples, he called his disciples and he prepared breakfast for his disciples. This is a very important aspect. So one day, if I have a leader's retreat or sell leader's retreat, I will be feeding you breakfast because I learned how to do omelets and scrambled eggs and so forth. So that was what they're doing. Almost daily, they got together and they broke bread. Twice it's mentioned from this passage. So that's very important aspect. Yes, we are living in America. Yes, American churches kind of move away having meal together. But let's mimic biblical church, not today's cultural church. Amen? Yes, it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of toils. But if we are to build one another, and I believe that is a very important aspect. And second thing, in the area of fellowship, what they did was they sold their possessions and their goods, and they shared with each other. They sold their property, their houses, and their land, and brought the money into the church, and they shared together. And all these people, whether they were poor, some of them were rich, but they were lacking nothing between and among one another. And how can we apply this principle to today's church? How many of you have houses? Oh, I know some of you have, but you don't want to raise your hands because I may ask you to sell your houses. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. But in today's context, how can we apply this? People sold their possessions and shared their goods together. And just like in the wilderness, when they went out to collect the manna, as we understood, no one was lacking anything. People who got together and gathered much did not lack anything or had a leftover. Those people who gathered a small amount did not lack anything. As a church, as a body of Christ, we get together that we need to be sensitive to the need of the people. But also in today's context, what I like to do, what I like to challenge us is every single of us, we have a, some specialty, certain experiences, a certain knowledge. All these things, when we bring them together to the church, we can share, we can build his church, and we can Feel the needs of other people. Spirituality of a Christian is very important. How I surrender my life completely for the sake of gospel. But also, we have a specialty. You may have a computer skill. You may be a designer. You may be rich. You may be the businessman. Whatever gifts, whatever specialties God may have entrusted you or have given to you as the body of Christ, when we get together and we begin to share those items, it will be truly edifying and build the church and be benefited by other person's specialty. So as a church, we need a spirituality that is more important. No matter how much you are expert, you come to church and you want to serve, but with that expertise, with that specialty, you want to share, but without commitment, without intimacy that you want to enjoy with the Christ. When you don't have that spiritual aspect, it becomes burdensome to the church. But without specialty, you only have a spirituality but church cannot be profited. But everyone, we have uh, about 150 or so. If every single person brings one specialty and want to share with other church members or towards church, this church will be better than any kind of company that is ran in society. Can we say amen to that? So 
as you see need of this church, we want to develop and renovate our atrium. We want to renovate Corino. Yeah. We want to improve our website. All these things, as a church members, if you contribute your specialty, that this church will be much more benefited and edified. Amen. And third aspect in the area of fellowship we can see is when these people got together, we are talking about over 3,000 people, but these people are not homogeneous group. As we read, let's read a couple of verses in chapter 2 when the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened. Um, verse 9 starting from verse 8, chapter 2. And how here we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, and Jews, and proselytes, Cretus, and Arabians. You hear, along with Mediterranean seas, all these nations surrounding that sea came to Jerusalem. So these are people, even though they were Jewish background, however, people from Africa, they look, they had a darker skin. So this church was a multi-ethnic, multinational church from the very beginning. It was not a homogeneous group. And later on, as we can understand, the church, as they reached out to Gentile nations, the church was composed with a Jew and also Gentile. Always, the church seemed to be multi and colorful, multinational, and multi-ethnic. But in today's society, even in America, when we go to shopping mall, it's a multi-ethnic. When we go to school, it's a multi-ethnic. When we go to company and workplaces, it's a multi-ethnic. But when you come to church, it's only segregated, homogeneous group. Why? If we call ourselves Christians, that when we be one together and by serving one another and becoming one, the world will may know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. But, but we are so narrow-minded that we cannot understand a person that is different than I. Culturally, personality-wise, language-wise, that is a serious issue, I believe. But... God brought down the wall between the people, between people and God first, and also among ourselves. If we are to truly exercise the power of the gospel, that we can overcome our own differences inside a church, it must look different. If we go back to the book of Revelation, chapter, let's go to the book of Revelation quickly. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. Is that 17 or 7? 7. Let's read it. 7, 9 through 12. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. In other words, the church in eternal heaven looks like a multi-ethnic. All different people, different nations, different colors, different tongues got together but worshiped the same God and same Lamb of God. That's how it looks like in heaven, the church. As we pray the Lord's Prayer, let your will be done as it is in heaven and on earth. Then may that prayer be accomplished on this earth. So this is my challenge. This is 
one of our vision as a GMI EM that we want to be multi-ethnic. We want to be with more nations. Imagine ourselves, if we are to put a flag, any person, any church member representing his heritage or her background, national background, from our walls, we can have a Korean flag, American flag, Japanese, Chinese, Taiwanese, South Africa, Mexico, Argentina, Afghanistan, and Israel. All these people coming together. Because why? Why is it possible in Southern California? Because we know statistically, every day in Southern California, more than 180 different languages are spoken daily. In America, in general, 213 different languages are spoken. And that's our demographic. Unless these different peoples are reached with the gospel, we have no excuse. As an English-speaking congregation, we have no excuse that we do not reach out to the people other than people with a Korean background. That's why repeatedly I honor those people who come to our ministry who are other, who have a different background than Korean. You sustain, you remain, you become conduit, you become channel to invite more different people's group to our ministry. So with a different tongues, a different people, with a different culture, so we come together, worship same God. Amen? May we foresee that? May we have a common vision for that? Can we, can I hear great loud, loud voice to this? Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 About 10 years ago, when I visited Kazakhstan, especially to the city of Garaganda, there was a church, one of the largest church in Kazakhstan. It was planted by a pastor named Igor Kim. He is now missionary to Israel. And when I visited their Sunday worship, I was astonished. That is possible. In Kazakhstan, because they were occupied by Russian government for 70 years, in Kazakhstan, there were multiple people living together. And inside of that church, they were worshiping God with a Russian, and also underneath a Russian, they had a Kazakh language, the praise lyrics. But the demographic of that church there were Caucasians, there were Kazakhs and Asians and all these people from even Chechen, multi-ethnic. So it is a possible. It's a possible. And also if you go to Ukraine, I don't know if you heard a pastor called Sunday Adelaya or Adelaiza. He is a Nigerian pastor. He was born in Nigeria. Another was he's an African. He went to Belarus in 1986 to study at a university. After he finished the college, he went to Ukraine, and he got married there, and he became immigrant, and he planted a church with a few of African students in Ukraine, predominantly white-colored people. Now, that church is the largest church in Europe. Their church is 25,000 people, multi-ethnic. And the pastor is African. He has a dark skin. But their church members, predominantly white, with the darker skins and Asians and all these Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian, all these people. Now, they have planted about 700 churches throughout 40 different countries. It is possible if we shift our own paradigm, if we are willing to overcome our bias and our prejudice, knowing that Christ brought down all the walls between the people, and if we can have a bigger heart, open heart, and if we are baptized by one spirit, I believe it is possible. Amen? Praise God. So that was a primitive church, how it looked like. And the church we will see when we go to heaven, it will be multi-ethnic. Let the will of God as it is, it is in heaven be done on this earth, and especially in Southern California and in Orange County. Amen?
but also deeper than that. That's how they looked like on the surface. They ate together. They shared their common things, sold the possession, and they looked colorful, but also, more importantly, they became one. They became one. From these few verses, there are vocabulary we can recognize. From 42, steadfastly, it says, and 44, they, all that believed were together. And 45, all men, as every man had a need, continually daily, continuing daily with one accord. And also on 40, 46, again, singleness with a gladness and singleness of heart. They had over 3,000 people coming together with a different background, with a different nationalities. They spoke different languages. However, they were in one accord. If church can become one, be united together for common vision, there will be tremendous power exerted out of that church. And because we become one, there will be love of Christ manifested among us. That's why we love about going to Trestias. Why? Because we become one. As we become one, joy, peace, and love are so evident and so much realized. That's why we want to go there. But every day, we want to make our church like a TV. If we can be one, following and led by the Holy Spirit, under the leadership, under the same vision, same cause, laying down our own preferences and our own opinions and our own ideas, if we can be one together, evidently, tremendous joy and love will be exercised among us. Can we say amen to this? Amen? So let's become one. Let's pray for singleness of heart. And thirdly, third aspect or third dimension of this church, church to the world. And obviously they preach the gospel diligently. Verbally they preach the gospel. Even though they did not specifically mention that, but obviously we know they went out to the world and preached the gospel. But two items, how word responded towards the church, it's very interesting. 43, verse 43. This is how the world and the people responded to the church. Fear came upon every soul. As a church was baptized by the Holy Spirit, as a church was moving forward powerfully, people surrounding that church became fearful of them. How is it? Because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of holiness. When church members, when the church becomes so holy, so separating themselves from this worldly lust, the people who are sinners and lead a wicked life, when they see and confront the holy people, naturally they become fearful. Once with our founding pastor, with the pastor Kim, many, many years ago, probably about 15 or 16 years ago, with a few of us went to Chinese restaurant. And we were sitting in the round table. And Pastor Kim was sitting one side, but no one was going to sit nearby him. One or two chairs were empty right beside him. Everyone was afraid to sit by him. And Pastor Kim jokingly said, why isn't anyone sitting right beside me? Have you been leading sinful life? <laughs> he's a such a holy, see, he's a such an anointed man. If you are ashamed of your own life, you have a guilty feeling, and you know how wicked you've been leading life lately, you're not going to approach to the person who is a such anointed with the Holy Spirit. 
if church today is anointed with the Holy Spirit and engaging into the power of Spirit, the world will become fearful of us. However, nowadays, unfortunately, people and the world mock at the church. Why? Because we lost the holiness. Because we mimic the world, not mimicking life of Christ. The church has to be like a mirror. The people in this world, their faces are tainted with the sins. And when they go to the mirror, they can look at their face and be ashamed and embarrassed. Oh, I have a spots and I have dirt on my face. And will be embarrassed and be frightened to look at their lives. However, this mirror, the mirror of church, has been tainted also with a sin and with a lust, with a purposeness. The world cannot differentiate between themselves and the church. And they come towards a mirror, and mirror is tainted, and they cannot see their faces. That's why they mock us instead of fearing us. That's just something that we need to really return back to God and ask God. We repent, make us a difference, consecrating our lives completely. They're leading really, truly different life than the world. Then the world will see us, our anointing, our holiness, and they will become fearful. Not just for the sake of becoming fearful, but giving the conviction of their sin and so that they may become repentant. Amen? And second item, the response of the word, we can see is on verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Not only these people were fearful of the church, but also they had a favor towards the Christians. Why? Because the Christians were beneficial to the society. Even though they led a separated and consecrated lives, but they, by good works, were the light and the salt to the world, so they received the favor from the people. Just like Daniel and his three friends, even though they were living in Gentile world, in Babylonian, because of their life, because of their goodness benefited the kingdom, even kings wanted to hire Daniel continually. That's how we had to be like that. Yes, we are out of this world, but we are in this world to be the light and the salt. And other people, whether we are in the workplaces or in the school, they must see our goodness and good works and say, we need you. We need you, Christians, and receive a favor from them. That's our challenge. Can, if we can determine ourselves to move forward as English ministry, having this attitude and having this determination, gradually we can influence the world and God will bring people to our church. Amen? So, church... The lifestyle, it's the center of the world. God's eyes are focused now upon this church. So there's an upward activity, church to God, and also church within church or church to church having fellowship, and then church to outside. Outward activity, that's evangelism and how people respond to the church. Then lastly, that's forward activity. When church are engaging what God wants them to engage, then what God does is God to the church, he takes church and begins to move forward. And on verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily as, a, as a should be saved. So adding his people to the church is God's job. It's not our responsibility. As we enjoy fellowship, as we enjoy worship, as we exercise evangelism, naturally, God will add His people to His church. 
God will take our church and move forward. Unless as a church we move forward, there will be no joy sustained. Only flowing, flowing water is fresh. If water in a pond stays the same, and the water will become rotten, be corrupted, and bitter. If church does not move forward, it will be just like that. We become bitter. We are hating one another. We are fighting amongst ourselves unless we move forward. But if God is pleased with this ministry and with this church, he will take this church and move forward. How does he move forward? Numerically, he will move forward by adding his people. When we see new members coming to our church, naturally we become joyful. Don't you agree with me? When newborn babies are in the family, there's excitement, there's joy, there's a vitality. When there's a newborn babies are in the church, there's a vitality, there's a joy, there's a excitement. That's what we want to see within our ministry. And God not only adds continually as we begin to read the book of Acts, not only He's adding His people as we move on. Let's look at the book of Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now, by this time, after church overcoming certain obstacles and certain oppositions, look at this. Now, in those days, number of the disciples, it's not only just the people. Number of the disciples was added, no, multiplied. God begins to not only add his people, but his disciples are being multiplied. And on verse 7, that's after they overcame division among Hebraic widows and Jewish widows. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. And if we go to chapter 9, verse 31, then the churches, subject is the churches. The churches throughout the old Judea and Galilee and Samaria had a peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. In other words, churches were multiplied. So progress, progressively, God was adding saved save people to the church. Later on, disciples were multiplied. Then, ultimately, churches were multiplied. That's what we want to see as His church. Amen? We already have seen that last 31 years from this church, from GMI. GMI began 31 years ago with three families, with a Korean-speaking people only. Now, 31 years later, this church has sent out 275 missionaries in 58 different nations. And Pastor Kim, our founding pastor, is estimating about 9,000 churches planted throughout the globe. Churches were multiplied. In the beginning stage, God added the people, predominantly Korean people. Disciples were multiplied. And then churches were multiplied throughout the world. And we are estimating about 9,000 churches within 30 years. One years of ministry. Us, as an English-speaking congregation, we have a mission. We have a vision. Starting from Southern California in Orange County, if we begin to reach out to non-Koreans, and whether Korean or not, doesn't matter. As long as they are not saved, as long as they are souls and people, we can take the gospel to them and preach the gospel, bring them to our church, disciple them, and have a fellowship and eat together oftentimes and become one continually. And God will take this church and move forward. Not only numerically that he will increase but geographically as well 
they started out from Jerusalem, but went to all Judea, Samaria, but to the uttermost parts of the world. This church began on Euclid. It's not too far away from this location with the three families, but went to 54, 58 different nations, planted a church. Us, we can do same way, even greater way. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a spirit of vision. When the Holy Spirit fell upon the people, Apostle Peter mentioned and rephrased what Prophet Joel has mentioned in second chapter of the book of Acts. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Prophet Joel is prophesizing that old men will dream dreams and young men will see the vision or vice versa. Holy Spirit comes upon us. We begin to dream dreams and we begin to see visions and we begin to prophesy. Prophecy, dream, and visions are all for the future because Holy Spirit is a spirit of vision. With our church, all of us, if we have believed that Jesus is the Savior and the Lord, then we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. That means we must dream. We must see the, see the vision. Geographically, numerically, God can take us and move forward to the uttermost parts of the world. And he will begin to add. He will begin to multiply his disciples. He will begin to multiply his churches. That's the vision that we want to see. Just like Abraham, even though he did not have a, even have one single son, by looking at the stars in the sky, by looking at the dust of his shores, he began to dream dreams. Someday, I will have multitudes of descendants like stars and like dust of the earth. Us, we have many, many more souls than Abraham had. We have over 150 people. We have more than three families. But if we trust and rely upon the Holy Spirit, and in Holy Spirit, if we begin to dream dreams, I believe God will take us and move forward, not only numerically, but also geographically. And churches will be multiplied in the world. Let's pray together. I want all of us to stand up. And one thing that I'd like to ask you, if you can kind of get closer with your neighbors and hold hands together, symbolically what we want to do is these 120 people got together in the same room and in one accord, they pray together. Can I invite those people sitting on the wings, move to the center? And hold the hands together with your neighbor. Is that you, Haruka? Can you move towards center? One hundred twenty people waited urgently, eagerly for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They prayed in one accord. Us, one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty people holding hands together, signifying that we are one. We have a one accord, and asking God if You can baptize us with Your Spirit, if You can empower us with Your Spirit, whether we are Koreans, whether we. Are frazzled, whether we fall often, whether we are weak, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, as He's a church, we can move forward to the uttermost parts of the world. We can dream big, we can see the vision, and we can prophesy. God, have mercy upon us. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, unite us together with a one mind, with a singleness of heart. Make us one by your spirit, Father. Oh, help us to overcome differences, overcome differences in our culture, in our language, in our background. By your gospel, by your spirit, 
by you make us one make us one and take us take us and help us to move forward can we call name of jesus and ask god fill us with your spirit fill us with your holy spirit baptize us with the holy spirit cast down all of our pieces and our sins cleanse us purify us liberate us bind us together with your spirit with your love father today is the 31st birthday as a second generation as a english speaking congregation we want to dream bigger we want to dream new dream father lord have a mercy upon us help us and prepare us to ride second wave of world missions recently Dickon Board decided to give and allocate 30% of our ministry's finance for the world mission. KM, long time ago, decided to allocate 50%. We are going that step. We have that same spirituality, that same DNA. With the 30%, we are showing to God, God, we are serious about this world mission. Not only do we want to embrace this DNA, but Lord, we want to go further. We want to dream bigger even. With the faith, with the sacrifice, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this. So let's call out Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus! Jesus!